Well, good morning. It is a joy to be with you. It always feels like coming home here. And I just thank you so much for your prayers, your support. Almost every week, I have someone from Franklin visit our church in New York and come up and say hello. So if you're ever in the city and you're free for church, please come worship with us. And uh, it's always such a delight to have you in New York, your sister church, Church of the City, New York, and to be able to worship together. So thank you once again for having me back for the seventh year in a row. Now, it's true uh, what Darren said. What I want to do is put this particular story about Herod in context. Uh, Most people don't really think much about Herod, and Herod in some sense gets often removed, particularly during Advent, from most of the talks. Nobody has a nativity scene with Herod in it. We don't gather, you know, all of the animals and all the sheep and the wise men. Herod is always pushed out of the side. The Herod, in many ways, may be one of the most important characters to understand, particularly his life and his background and the kingdom that he tried to build in the midst of Jesus' life and ministry. Often what we do, if we're not careful, is we just basically decorate our lives with a few Christmas themes every year. And then we just get on with our regular American lives. Rather than understanding who Jesus was, the kingdom that he came to bring into the world and why it was such a threat to characters like Herod. I don't know uh, if you've ever gotten a, a family photo taken at the mall before where you get to choose your background. Have you ever done that? And uh, they say, would you like the sort of, uh, you want the Hawaiian theme? Would you like the Alaskan theme? You can pick summer or winter. And they, they pull a blind down and then you stand in front of it and then sort of pretend you're having a great time and then that goes up and you go back to our lives. Many of us, if we're not careful at Christmas time, pull a slide down, have our little Christmas experience and then let it go back up like our lives are fundamentally the same. Jesus didn't come to the earth So occasionally, we could pull a slide down and reference his kingdom point. He came to change human history. And I don't think there's any way that we see that in contrast more clearly than talking about the person Herod. So that's where we're going to spend our time today. Now, we're ultimately going to end up in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. But we're not going to get there till the end of the talk because I want to put these verses particularly in context. And I also just want to acknowledge that the vast majority of this content comes from a book called Herod the Great by Norman Gelb and also from a scholar named Ray Vanderland. So that's where a lot of this background material comes from. Now, I want you to imagine trying to understand the year 2000 and beyond in the United States of America without having any cultural understanding about 9-11, Ground Zero, ISIS, or President Trump. I want you to imagine you removed all of those factors and then 2000 years from now, you read an account of the United States, but you failed to know those characters and those events. Wouldn't it be almost impossible to understand American history without understanding these key events? In some sense, it's impossible to understand the context of the Gospels without understanding Augustus Caesar and also Herod the Great. So I want to start by putting everything in context by talking about Augustus. The reason that Augustus, and there should be a picture of him here, the reason that Augustus is important, an important figure, because he was the first emperor to call himself a god while he was alive. There was some tradition that Roman emperors would ascend to the gods after their death. But he was the first leader to claim that he was a son of God while he was still alive. Augustus is the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And you know Julius Caesar from high school history was an important figure in the history of Rome because he basically became Rome's first emperor. He was the one that seized power and changed the framework of government and the structure of what happened in the Roman Empire. He was ultimately assassinated, but he had adopted a young man with a ton of people skills and political promise named Octavius. And so he adopted him who went on to take the name um, Augustus, and that's how we get Augustus today. Augustus, when he uh, got into power, was a very, very skillful politician. He had just a way of understanding human motivation and was able to unite the Roman Empire together. He did this through relationships, but he also did this through skillful seizing of cultural moments. Many politicians utilize a strategy called shock doctrine. And shock doctrine is basically an idea that says you wait for an event to happen or you manufacture an event, but you wait for an event to happen where people are psychologically disturbed and willing to give up a lot of common sense and a lot of freedom for security 
from the government. And then you push an agenda through when people are psychologically manipulated. Well, Augustus had one of these moments. A comet appeared in the sky and everybody in the empire saw it. And so Augustus sees that and he said, aha, you know what that comet was? That was my father, Julius Caesar, ascending to the gods. And if he's now a god, you know what that makes me? A son of God on earth. And so Augustus was the first emperor to take the title Augustus, son of God. And he actually issued a coin called an advent coin, heralding his emperor. This was distributed widely in the Roman Empire. This is a sign of Augustus's advent where he was celebrated as a son of God on earth. So he comes to power and basically establishes peace in the Roman Empire, the Pax Romana. Now, part of the challenge that he had in establishing uh, the rule of Rome basically around the world is that the empire was vast, the the, the extent, the span of the Roman Empire was extraordinary. And so instead of having to shuffle troops around all the time, basically they would come to an area, conquer the area, and then let the people know that if you were willing to basically pledge allegiance to Rome and pay taxes, you can continue life as normal. And as life would go on, if trouble would arise, they would basically put into place puppet kings, kings who were loyal to Rome, who would basically establish a power base so that Rome's rule and reign could functionally continue. Now, one of the challenging areas that the Romans had to deal with was this this tiny little piece of land, frustrating and annoying, called Israel. And the problem with the Jewish people who lived in Israel is that they believed that not Rome, but they were supposed to be the dominant figures in human history. They believed that they had promises about a coming Messiah. They believed that all of the nations would ultimately come up to Jerusalem and then a Messiah would appear who would rule on David's throne in the city of Jerusalem and that every other nation would bow its knee and recognize him as the Messiah. So when the Romans came along and they said, sorry, you're wrong, Augustus is actually going to be the king, and he's actually, going to, he's actually going to rule from Rome, not from Jerusalem. This produced such anger in, in the Jewish people, and they were constantly revolting against whoever would oppress them. And this is where Herod comes on the scene in helping Rome rule in Jerusalem. Now, Herod, we read about in this passage in Matthew 2, where it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. So Jesus is born into the time of the figure that Augustus institutes as the king over Jerusalem. And here's basically what happened. Herod, Herod the Great, was born in 73 BC. Pompey, the general, storms Jerusalem, and Judea is absorbed into the Roman Empire in 63 BC. Hyrcanus II, who was the high priest, was permitted to remain in power, and Herod the Great's father, Antipater, remains his trusted advisor. Caesar appoints Antipater, the procurator of Judea, basically establishing Herod's father as the one overseeing the region. And then Antipater appoints his son Herod, the governor of Galilee. So Herod is put into power by his father in Galilee. Now, he begins to, be, to get ruthless and power hungry. And so he oversteps his pounds and the Sanhedrin basically take a vote to discipline him and remove him from power. You remember that the Sanhedrin was the council of Jewish leaders who oversaw all of their affairs. So, as this is going on, the Persians rebel against Rome, and then Herod sees this as an opportunity to reestablish his power base. So he runs to Rome to meet with Augustus and to basically ask for backing and troops to cement Rome's rule in the region. So when he goes there, he meets with Antony and Caesar Augustus, and they go into the Senate, and they make a declaration. Here's what they say to Herod. Herod, we are going to give you a title, King of the Jews, and you will have the backing of Rome as long as you're loyal to us and pay your taxes to be able to rule these stubborn Jewish people. And this is how history records it. The meeting was dissolved, and Antony and Caesar Augustus left the Senate house with Herod between them. They went to offer sacrifices and to lay up the decree in the capital, and thus did Herod take royal power, becoming officially the king of the Jews. Now, when he came back to Jerusalem to rule, when he got ready to rule, he came back in 37 BC with a huge army to take out anybody who had previously resisted his rule. He had 11 battalions of infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and when the troops poured into the city of Jerusalem, a massacre basically began to take place in the streets. Herod's Jews, the Jews of Herod's army were determined to leave none of his political opponents alive. 
And so they basically pushed people into these tiny little alleys as they were trying to escape and butchered them together. This is how one historian puts it. The slaughter was beyond description. Women were raped and slaughtered, children were brutally killed, and soldiers were tortured and chopped to pieces. He killed 45 of the 70 Jewish leaders in the Sanhedrin and basically put in puppet leaders who would yield allegiance to him. And he warned the Pharisees that they could live as long as they stayed out of politics and only worried about piety. There was a group of people who fled from Jerusalem and they went into a series of caves hanging on a cliff. And he was so determined to get them that he invented new military technologies. And it was basically a system of ropes and pulleys where they would go up onto these cliffs that these people thought were impregnable. And he would go up and he would set these fires and smoke out these caves where the men were hiding. And as the men came to the front of the uh, the caves to breathe, he had a system of hooks that would grab them and throw them from the caves down to their death below. So insistent was he on removing any opposition to his rule. So here is the problem that he faces then. He now has the backing of Rome. He's now terrified the Jewish people and established his rule in Jerusalem. And now he has to try and win the hearts of the people he's just slaughtered back. Now the challenge he has that in, is in order, to be, uh, in order to be loyal to Augustus and loyal to the Roman emperor, he begins to set up all of these shrines and temples acknowledging that Augustus was a god. Now if you're a Jewish person, the first commandment is loving God And listed in the Ten Commandments as having no other gods before him. And so now you've got somebody claiming to be the king of the Jews who is spending his energy and resources setting up idols, worshipping a pagan oppressor throughout their land. And this only further went on to cement the hatred of the Jewish people against the man who claimed to be their king. Let's look at his family for a minute so you can sort of develop his character. He had 11 wives and 43 children, and he was constantly suspicious that his family wanted to get rid of him so they could claim his power. He had a wife, his favorite wife, whose name was Mary Amney, and he loved her. He genuinely loved her. Once when he, w- when he went away on a trip, he was concerned about her attitude, and he said, if on the trip I die, kill her immediately. She's had me assassinated because she wants one of our sons to rule on the throne. When he came back from the trip, he didn't like her attitude, so he had her executed. She brought the two sons that he had with her in before him, and he said to them both, tell me why I shouldn't kill you. And he made them basically plead for their lives, and then he went ahead and killed both of his sons anyway. Aristobulus was becoming popular as one of the young high priests in the city of Jerusalem, and so suspicious of his power and envious of how the people loved him, he brought him out to his country house in Jericho, which is basically the summer homes of all of the cultural elites. So he brings the young high priest out, gets him drunk, and then drowns him in his swimming pool to remove any threat and religious popularity. He also executed two other high priests at the time when they became too popular, And at one point when he was concerned that when he died, people would cheer because he was so hated, he ordered on his death that the most popular people in Jerusalem would be rounded up into the Hippodrome and slaughtered so at least somebody would weep that he had died. He took the name Herod the Great and his slogan was, make Israel great again. (laughs) Just kidding. Um, But this is a man... This was a man who had a vision of greatness. He began a building campaign, honestly, that, that, that is one of the most extraordinary building campaigns in all of history. The first thing he began to work on was a place called Masada. Now, Masada, you should see a, a picture of Masada here. Masada was one of the places that apparently, legend had it, King David hid uh, when he was hiding from Saul. And so Herod said, if David hid in a cave in Masada, I want to rule from a palace in Masada. So this is what he began to do. He built a three-story palace that had marble inlaid designs throughout the palace. He had hot and cold tubs and a whole series of water aqueducts to provide water for wherever they are. He had Italian columns, Italian columns imported from Rome. He had artists come in and paint all of the frescoes. On the roof, where it hadn't rained in years, he put a pool there, and he rebuilt in the middle of the desert a channel of water from Jerusalem, 17 miles away, with enough water in it that flowed into these giant cisterns where there was enough 
The, the systems were so large, they could support 10,000 people's water supply indefinitely. He found a way to preserve dates and figs and other food, where in the 1960s, archaeologists, while exploring Masada, pushed through a wall and found a secret area where his food had been stored, and they found dates and figs from 1,960 years earlier, and they ate them. Three people died. <laughs> they actually didn't die, they're fine. Isn't that amazing, though? That after almost 2,000 years, he found ways not only of building but preserving food that outlasted him. He was so advanced that where everywhere he went, he basically built monuments to himself. Now, put this in perspective. This beautiful balcony here, which, by the way, they did a wonderful job of, and uh, it's an in incredible asset and um, upgrade for the worship center here. But this balcony took seven months to build. He built a palace on a cliff. And that was just the beginning of all he began to build. Then he moves into the temple. So he wanted to show people, I'm a greater king than David. He hid in a cave, I live in a castle. Then he turns to the temple. He decided to make the temple of God in Jerusalem bigger, so he began to expand it. He hired 18,000 people to work on it. He made it with his, it was basically laid on this foundation of what's called Herodian stones. He dug down three stories below the earth and then put these huge stones in place to lay the foundation. This is a picture of one of those stones today. They're 10 feet by 10 feet by 80 feet, and they weigh hundreds of tons. They're almost impossible to move, even today with all of our construction materials available to us. Because the temple site was considered a sacred site, he didn't allow any sort of work to happen on the site itself. So all of these stones were dug in a quarry and then moved and assembled in Jerusalem. And it says, when they were put together, even though they were dug and made miles away, when they were placed, they fit together almost perfectly. He used 2.3 million of these stones placed together to lay the foundation for the temple. And if you were to go to the Temple Mount today, and many of you have been there on trips, and you pray or whatever, these stones are the Herodian stones that he had put in place. Here's what he wanted people to know. In Masada, David hid in a cave. I'm in a palace. Solomon built you a temple that you thought was good. You should see the temple that I've built. In fact, it was said, the rabbi said this, that you have never experienced true beauty unless you've witnessed upon sunrise or sunset the shining of the light of the beauty of the temple. It's one of those breathtaking scenes you could see. He built that primarily as a tribute to himself. But he wanted to go on. He didn't want to just impress the people about the kind of king he was. He didn't want to impress them about the sort of religious favor that he could show the people. He wanted the Caesars to know that he was a player on the global scene. He wanted to prove to them that this region that he was given to oversee was worthy of a global stage. Part of the problem that they had was that the coastline near Israel wasn't very good for trade. And so he wanted to build a state-of-the-art Greek city on the coast that would bring a lot of trade into the region and further boost the economy. The problem is the coast was all swampy and nothing could be built on it. No one could even build a proper port there. And he wanted to be able to control and redirect all of the shipping lines to make money. So here's what he said to his builders. Rebuild the coastline. So he drains the marsh and then rebuilds it and has his state of, a state-of-the-art city built, which was called Caesarea. Now, this is a total suck-up to the Caesars. Hey, Caesar, why don't you come visit me? I've built a, Caesar, a city for you. What's it called? Well, I called this one Caesarea after you. Total politician, ruthless. The largest harbor in the world at the time was 60 acres, and it was in Athens. And he builds a harbor that is 520 acres out of nothing. He brought in concrete from Italy and poured it down 80 feet and 100 feet wide to establish it. He built an underground sewage system for the city that would drain out with the tides so there would be healthy sanitation. The nearest fresh water was 19 miles away, so he built an aqueduct from the mountain 19 miles away. Each meter that it traveled, it fell one centimeter, and to this day, it is less than a centimeter off after 2,000 years, still traveling 19 miles. Everything he did was on a staggering scale. He built a palace that went out over the ocean, and he didn't like the ocean, so he built a freshwater swimming pool in the middle of the ocean. One historian said that he built a stadium there, 
that had approximately 350,000 seats. It was 1.3 miles round at the top. And legend has it that one day as he's sailing into Caesarea on a boat, he sees it from a distance and he doesn't like how it looks. So he yells out this phrase, cover it in marble. And they cover the city in marble. And this is what artists believe it would have looked like from a distance. If Caesar visited, you know what he would have said? Herod is truly great. But not to be outdone, he was, was a little bit sort of paranoid about people trying to take his power. He was worried about threats coming to him from, his, from the place, um, from, from uh, sorry, opposition from the north. So he basically set up a series of escape palaces along the way back down towards where he was from. And this is where he built the Herodian. He wanted to have a place between Jerusalem and his home country of Eden, where if Antony and Cleopatra came after him, he would be able to survive. So you can see he begins to build downwards positions of safety so he can retreat in luxury. So he said to them, I want you to build me a palace on a mountain, but there wasn't really a mountain in the middle of the wilderness. So there they found an old uh, volcano that was basically soft, and they filled it up, and they built him in the palace in the middle of nowhere. On the top of the palace, he had a swimming pool with a gazebo in the middle that was nine feet deep that you needed a boat to get to on top of this mountain. It was the third largest palace in the ancient world, and he built the entire area around it up. Halls, aqueducts, fountains, bars, and colonnades. This is a picture of that today, 2,000 years later. Not only did he do this, but he began to propagate his reputation around the world. He paid for a Pythian temple in Antioch. He funded the Olympic Games. Let that sink in. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Olympic Games is brought to you by Herod the Great. I mean, can you believe that? He just funded an Olympics. He was also known to, to sponsor other events in honor of Augustus and other emperors around the empire at the time. Now, his home base in the midst of all of this was actually in Jerusalem. But if you've ever been to Jerusalem, one of the things that stands out is that there's no farmland inside the city. So where did all of the elites that were loyal to him, living in this luxurious center, get their resources? Well, the way he basically did this was by taxing the people who were around him. He set up a system where he controlled the religious and governmental and economic system. He had a tight group of loyal elites who were with him. So what they did was they basically put taxes on everybody around them, particularly those day laborers having to work the land so that he could fund everything he built. Many historians believe that 80 to 90% of people in Jesus' day were involved in agricultural work. Most of Jesus' parables address this reality. Farmers going into debt, dealing with economic realities. So you have a small minority of elites who rule in the city, and everybody is being taxed so he can live in luxury. Herod the Great took between 25 and 33% of the grain and 50% of all of the fish in his region. Fishermen would come into a dock and waiting at one end of the dock would be Herod's men. They were known as tax collectors, where he would take fish for Herod, then he would take what he wanted, and he would give you whatever was left over. And so you can imagine how hated Jewish tax collectors were taxing fishermen. Caesar took 12.5% 12 12 of all of the crops. There was a Roman tribute tax, Herod's taxes, transit trade taxes, market exchange taxes, temple taxes, special offerings, and the religious leader said that you had to pay for many of the festivals, particularly in Jerusalem. This meant that many people paid something like 90% of their daily income towards taxes. And you know what that does? That gives us great compassion for people living in Canada today. <laughs> now... People are in debt. People are losing their family land. They're working for daily wages and they're just being decimated by one man's ruthless, brutal ambition. A delegation of people, of religious leaders, went to Rome pleading and asking them to remove him from power because he had, quote, reduced the entire people to destitute poverty. Herod reduced the people to poverty so he could build gazebos and hot tubs and he could can figs and dates. In one section of one of his palaces, they found a wine cellar and inside of it was a bottle of wine that in his day was worth our equivalent of $20,000 a bottle. He had a cellar filled with these things. People living in total 
poverty, he's drinking $20,000 bottles of wine. This is the reign of Herod the Great. Jesus is born towards the end of Herod's reign. Now, why this is interesting is because at this point, Herod is basically a paranoid schizophrenic. He's, he's literally losing his mind here. He contracted an STD earlier in his life. His genitals were rotting off. He suffered from horrific stomach pain, and all of this caused him to be completely paranoid. Now, are you all still with me? Now, take all of that, all of that context, all of that history, and now let's listen to God's Word from a fresh vantage point. Let's hear God's Word. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, get ready for an understatement, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Who was in Jerusalem? All of the cultural elites, loyal to Herod, oppressing the poor who aligned with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers in the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Now, many people believe that the Magi were basically Persian elites who during Daniel's time, towards the end of his life, after he lists out all of these prophecies about, prophecies about the coming kingdom, tracked with Daniel's prophecies, were influenced by his vision of the future, and were following world events, particularly sort of astrology, believing that, a, that these, these would give them the clues they needed to follow the Messiah. And so... He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. So Jesus is a political refugee running for his life as a megalomaniac is trying to destroy him. And so was fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. This is called the killing of the innocents in accordance with the time he'd learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Do you see why the death of Jesus is not just a sentimental death? Sorry, do you see why the death of Herod is not just a sentimental death? This is one of the most important moments in history. This is when you've got somebody who claims to be king, getting ready to come to the end of his life. He's trying to establish a legacy and a dynasty so his greatness will extend forever. And now a threat emerges. A baby's been born who is claiming his very title that was given him to Rome. And he's anxious, creating fear. This is the threat of Christmas. Herod was disturbed, Jerusalem's disturbed, the elites are disturbed, the corrupt are disturbed because someone's coming to rule the children of Israel and he's not a maniac, he's a shepherd. He's not somebody to be with personal, godless ambition. He's ambition for the glory of God and concern for the people. Herod is a tyrant, Jesus is a servant. Christmas is a threat against selfish ambition and the tyranny of the world. That's the good news 
of Christmas. It's a contrast in kingdoms. This is why it's so important that we let what Jesus established at Christmas shape our lives. This is why we just can't pull down sort of the Christmas setting once a year and live normal American lives. The death and life of Jesus changed everything, and that needs to be the context in which we live. If we let society rob us of the wonder of Christmas, every year we're going to sing more and more songs about the weather, and every year society's going to get more and more disordered. We're already doing Christmas cups at Starbucks before Thanksgiving. Something is wrong with the universe when we are celebrating Christmas before Thanksgiving, but overconsumption will sneak in and try to get us to forget the threat of Jesus to the tyranny of the world. That's what it is. That's the good news. Anytime ruthless, godless people try and oppress the world, Christmas is a threat to them that the Son of God is here bringing a kingdom of hope. Christmas is a threat to tyranny. But I know know that sometimes it doesn't feel like this. I know it doesn't feel like this. And we can experience this personally in our own lives. We can experience, particularly here in Western culture, where it just seems like the church is falling apart and the church is failing. Will there even be a future? Will consumerism win? Will secularism win? I don't think it will. If you were were a betting person and you were to put money in the first century on who was going to win the future, would you put your money on Herod the Great? Look at everything he'd built. Would you put your money on the Roman Caesars? Rome was called the Eternal City. Or would you put your money on this little peasant living on the outskirts of power who had fishermen as his followers who was crucified by the might of the Roman Empire? You're going to put money, okay, who's going to win the future? My guess is if you lived in the first century, 99.99% of you would have put money on Herod and the Caesars. But we have 2,000 years of history. And you know what that history tells us? That Jesus is worshipped by 2 billion people. And most of you knew almost nothing about Herod the Great from this passage here. This is the gift of Christmas. I was in Jerusalem driving along and I, and I had this moment of, of stark contrast. I took this photo out of the window of a car. And I was driving along, I'd just come from a a Bible college in Bethlehem where Palestinian Christians were just praying and talking about planting churches in predominantly a Muslim uh, part of the region, and they just had massive hearts for God. And I was driving along, I was struck by this image, because this is what it is. I had just come from the living people of God, the body of Jesus, thriving 2,000 years later. And I realized looking out of my window, this was the ruins of the Herodian. This is the ruins of Herod's life. Nobody even barely knows who Herod is. And yet the body of Jesus in that same town is thriving and dreaming and working for justice and working for the kingdom of God and working for change. Christmas is a reminder that regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what our circumstances are, God's hope has broken in and will continue to lead us along. So this is the first week. This is the vantage point we need to gather with, with believers all around the world. Christmas is a reminder that tyranny will not win. Christmas is a reminder that all the kings of the world will bow their knee to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christmas is a reminder... It's a reminder that we are on the winning side. It's a reminder of hope. So as we get ready over the next week to look at these various characters and how they see the story, let's enjoy this vantage point that nobody who sets themselves up against the Lordship of Jesus will ultimately win. Christmas is a message of hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope we have in you. We thank you for the gift of perspective. We thank you from the vantage point from which we stand, where we know that all over the globe right now, Jesus is being worshipped as the Lord of history. 
We thank you that he has split history in two, that every date that we live by is a date that acknowledges and recognizes Jesus as the most important person in history. So help us, Lord, this season, not just to to decorate our lives, but help us to live into the context of the resurrection and power of Christ our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to close our service and we're going to begin Advent by participating in the Lord's Supper together. So if the team would start to distribute the elements, uh, you will never think of Herod the same again, will you? What a, what a striking contrast. The two billion people are worshiping Jesus of Nazareth and most of us don't know anything about Herod the Great. What a vantage point. What a way of seeing the, the gospel story, of seeing the incarnation through the eyes of, uh, of Herod the Great, the King of the Jews. I'm going to take a couple of minutes as we kind of officially step into the Advent season, and I just want us to be still. Uh, we have uh, typically, generally, the Christmas season is a busy time of... Uh, work parties and family and uh, shopping and retail and it's just like an acceleration and we're going to take a few minutes as we step into Advent by being still and invite the presence of God to fill our hearts and fill our minds that we would approach the Advent season with great intentionality instead of being thrust into the Christmas season by retail culture. So I'm just going to create a little bit of space as we're distributing the elements to just be still. I'd encourage you once you get the elements that maybe you just bow your head, close your eyes, and be still as we commence Advent together. I want to invite you to stand. This is the time of year where we celebrate the coming of the Messiah. But he came for a very specific purpose. And we begin Advent at the foot of the cross, remembering what Christ has done for us. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, the Corinthian church, in 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together.
text says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. And so, God, we begin this season of Advent where the global church turns again towards the anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, the waiting. I pray, God, as your people, that we would not simply get swept up in the culture of consumerism during this busy time of year, but that we would instead be making room in our hearts, that we would be making room and uh, anticipating your presence in us, upon us, through us, the people of God. We step into this season, God, and we pray your blessings upon us and upon this Advent season. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Pastor John Tyson for opening the scriptures again. All right, that is week one of Advent. Next week, we're going to be looking at the vantage point of Joseph. You're not even ready for this, okay? May the grace and peace of Jesus be with you. Amen.